Hello, everyone, and good morning and or good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us today for the WeConnect Academy session entitled Implementing a Global Training Program, a Practical Approach um, with Jennifer Hoffman. Before we jump into things, I want to give you guys a few um, quick reminders. Uh, this session will be recorded and then up to our YouTube WeConnect Academy channel. So if you miss anything or you go back, um, you can always review it there. Um, it usually takes about five to seven days to get that uploaded. Um, so just keep that in mind. Also, we have a chat box and a question box um, where you can put in questions or comments throughout the, um, the webinar. So please feel free to use that. Um, our, my, our presenter today may ask you some questions. And um, if you do have a response, feel free to, to use those um, boxes. Um, well, without further ado, I do want to pass it over to Jennifer because we have a lot of information to get through today. Um, so Jennifer, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much and thank you all for spending a portion of your day with me. Today we're going to be talking about what's the formula for going global, specifically with a training program across a global organization. But a lot of these tips and tricks will probably apply to you going global with just a communication plan for your clients and your organizations around the world. So what, uh, excuse me, the, um, what we are, what I'd like you to do right now is go to that chat and just introduce yourself in the, and by sending a chat to organizers and panelists. And that way I can take a look at what it is you're writing. In the meantime, let me introduce myself. I am Jennifer Hoffman. I am a, the founder of InSync Training, and we've been in business in the United States for 20 years. InSync Training is a woman-owned business. We are a member of the WeConnect International Network, and I'm very excited to be able to share some of what we do with you today. Now, I started this company 20 years ago when everybody was talking about technology in its various forms, but nobody was really doing it well. It was the dot-com era in the United States, at least, and everyone was rushing to implement that next big thing, That whether it be uh, some kind of internet site or online training. And 20 years from then, we still have a lot of the same problems. But it we are focusing on technology and we're not focusing on people. The tech, we're expecting the technology to do the work for us. And as we are going global, the, the issues with focusing on technology and not people are that much larger. So real quick, what does InSync training do? We've got a team, a global team of more than 70 people, and we support live online instruction and blended learning. So this type of interaction, but imagine this type of webinar where everybody can speak and we can all write on the whiteboard and maybe we can pull into small groups to collaborate and come back with what we share. And we do this in lots of different languages, Turkish and Japanese and Portuguese and a lot of different languages. And we also develop, they call it micro-learning, little short videos and uh, small e-learning or interactive online things that maybe you could run on your phone that support learning. So this is what we do. And if you ever need help with any of that, you know, I'd love to talk to you. But that's not why you're here today. It's 2019. And the training industry, everybody kind of believes that we should be doing training online. There's online universities. You've, you've probably taken online courses. Maybe you've taken them through WeConnect. Everybody understands that we can be doing it, but we're not doing it well. And we're kind of putting stuff out there and hoping people use it and are very frustrated when people don't participate in our live online sessions or don't download the e-learning. I'm interested if you've got any challenges or what brought you here today. If you would go to the chat, that's in the lower right-hand corner, and send a chat to organizers and panelists, 
and please um, let me know why this topic interested you. And I'm going to stop talking for 30 seconds to see what comes in. Nobody can see, I think, what anybody else is writing. So I do think it will stay private. Andrea, is anything coming in on your side? Um, we have a couple people that have entered um, their introductions. Um, I don't want to read them loud since yeah. you know, not everybody <laughs> wants wants to divulge. Okay. But, um, yeah, in in some cases, it's it's really to to learn more, um, to expand their uh, online training. Mm -hmm. uh, Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, let, me, let me talk about some typical problems. This is why I think that this is an important topic. Most of the organizations are reaching out to their own countries, and we're very good at teaching to our own countries. But, we, um, but here are the problems that people are running into when we try to go global. Different countries are on different schedules. So some some countries do daylight savings time, some countries do not. One of the things we run into as an American-based company is that we change our clocks on a different schedule than Europe does. There's a two-week gap on each side of the clock changes. And I understand the European Union is going to stop changing their clocks. The question is, are we going to catch up? And what about Australia where they have, and India, I believe, where they have 30-minute time zones? So those different schedules make a big difference. And so those time differences mean that if we're trying to run a global program, often we're making people learn in the middle of the night because there's just two people on the opposite side of the world. We're actually scheduling a class now where we're teaching, but the learners are all in New Zealand. So our trainers are going to be teaching in the middle of the night. The content doesn't translate. Even US English versus UK English, the grammar is different. And it can almost be irritating to be trying to learn and seeing what you perceive as, say, spelling or grammar errors. And then sometimes the technology just doesn't work from country to country, even if it's in the same organization. Jennifer, so, we did have a couple okay. more come in, and so maybe um, this will help you throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, you know, some of them are really looking at understanding best practices and how to improve online training, um, how to connect and understand, um, how to improve and scale up um, to support global financial institutions and having an integrated global um, training platform. And there's another note here about English only courses and how to cater um, to what percentage of global students. Um, yep. and so, yeah. You know, I mean, that, that those are very typical problems. And I think we'll be touching on a lot of that today, but I do want to allow you to um, drop me questions. We've got tons and tons of free resources that I would love to share with you. And we're, I think that. We're going to paste a uh, link into the chat right now for everybody. You don't need to download this right now. You can download it later. We're going to give this to you at the end. But this is a toolkit with some recordings and blogs and articles on how to bring your training global. So what we're going to talk about today are the essential elements to consider when going global. Uh, is there a value in designing a program that works across a global platform? Learners and the organization, that's a big deal because sometimes we focus just on meeting organizational outcomes. We want to get it fast. We want to get it timely. We want to get it cheap. But how are we uh, supporting our learners? And how do we design for that? And then individually, how do we plan for success? Now, this is a lot to cover in 50 minutes or so. So again, I invite you to reach out on the things that you want to know more about. 
what we're really looking for in a global training program is global engagement. We need to get content and people together to achieve this global engagement. My business partner would say that we need three things for a training program. We need content, we need a way to deliver that content, whether it be a person or technology, and we need learners. So bringing those three things together in a way that meets the needs of a global audience is what we're trying to do. So the key to getting this right is getting enough value to justify the investment in money and resources and time and implement a design that gets to this global initiative. Generally, you're probably going to come up with a blended learning solution. And what I mean by blended is you probably won't have one delivery method. Maybe you'll be in a virtual classroom like this one for part of the time. Maybe you'll have some on-demand e-learning or some videos or some YouTube interactions or infographics and tools. These are all different things that we can use in a training program. And each element combined together plays a, has a different role. And those are the types of things I really want to talk about. So we want to get the right content at the right time in the right format with context. We want to engage our stakeholders. And those are the people in the business, the people in the training community, and the learners. Where are they when they're learning? If they're on the road, their environment is very different than if they're learning at their desk or learning at their home or learning in a classroom. And this gets us to global engagement. We want to take advantage of the technology. We need a strong communication plan. And I think a communication plan is where a lot of these programs fall down. Trying to encourage community so learning is not over just because we've ended the program and expanding the role of the producer, which is an assistant that can help us be super successful. So how do we create value? Let's start with how do we create value? We need to get, we need to think, is this program worth trying to deliver over a global enterprise, or should we just create from scratch in each different country or region that we're dealing with? If we're delivering a global program with one set of content, we've got to be careful about disengaging some of our learners because they think the content was just meant for the host country and not meant for them. And that can be very disengaging. I say a us first perception. Here in the United States, that would be a US first perception. And we're we're guilty of this. People, the language of business is English. The home office is in the United States, so therefore everybody needs to learn that way. But that doesn't work. It's not regionalized. We also want to create value by making sure everything's replicable, meaning the business outcomes are being met in all regions or countries. And we want to take advantage of people collaborating across these regions and countries because there's something to learn about how we work together by learning together. So if we might be teaching a new performance management system that's rolling out across the world, but we're also teaching our learners how to work together in this global and virtual environment. And that's a key competency today. So when we're talking about creating value, we think about content. What's constant across all regions and what's different from region to region? Things that are different include sometimes just laws or regulations. We just recently did a project and we needed to be very cognizant of the, ger the rules regarding the German Workers' Council. There are certain rules. The German Workers' Council needs to review our content. We need to roll it out the way we say we're going to roll it out. So there are rules and regulations there that we don't need to adhere to in other countries. Is it adding value across the board is the question. So we need to see if that difference should be um, consistent 
or we just create some content just for the, in this case, the German audience. Uh, I want to talk about under people engaging managers. We're very good at creating training, but we don't, and when we get to blended learning, we say this is great. People can learn from their desk. They can learn from a self, in a self-directed format, but we don't let their managers know, for example, how much time this is going to take and what's the value and really reinforcing that even though the content is self-directed, it's still valuable and required. So we need to get to know our learners wherever they are. And we create that connection, that global engagement. I think that that starts with a strong communication and marketing plan. And these things could be a class in and of itself. So some some tips. We need to create a global schedule for live training. This, these are maximizing outcomes, by the way, for both the organization and for our learners. These are the five things that matter most when we're designing these global initiatives. And I'll talk about each one of these in detail. Creating a global training schedule, a mostly universal design, and I'll talk about that, an evaluation strategy. We need to regionalize content, not just translate, but regionalize, and piloting is key. And by piloting, I mean roll it out once or twice or have many, however many times as we need to, but ensure that we're testing that content, that we are that it's working for all of the audiences in all the different regions. And we'll talk about these things in detail. I want to remind you that you can send questions in, and we'll have time for questions at the end. Or if there's a burning question, Andrea will just interrupt me, and we will answer the question right on the spot. So please send your questions in. This is a screenshot of a global training schedule. It's a multiple session program. It happens to have seven sessions in it. So seven these sessions would have topic names. What language is it being delivered in? Right now we're just showing English and German, but we also had, I think, Turkish and Spanish on this list as well for this particular client. And things like the local time, the, the day in the local time zone. When we start crossing the international dateline that makes a difference. Uh, the time of day, what's the region that we're targeting? Uh, there's a lot of information, and this is just one tab in the spreadsheet. A lot of detail goes into how do we communicate with our clients and how do we communicate with each other to make sure these live online sessions go well. We need to do things like deconflict lunch and holidays. For me right now, it's 9 a.m. For some of you, depending on where you are in the world, it could be as late as 3 or 4 or 5 p.m., I guess, right? Because we connect is everywhere. Uh, but we've learned things. Like you can, if we were delivering a piece of content, I can combine the west coast of the United States, which is California, Washington State, with China. Now, it might be daytime in one country and evening in the other country or overnight, or not quite, it's, but it's comfortable. It's comfortable learning for both California and China. But there's issues there, right? California and China are different countries, different cultures, different languages. And we'll talk about those different things when we talk about regionalizing. But we know the timing works. Some of the things, just some quick tips, is we try to avoid live training on Mondays and Fridays. Think about Monday. I told you that we're about to roll out a program in New Zealand. They roll, they want them on Mondays, which for my team in the United States means it's Sunday. If we can avoid Mondays and avoid Fridays, we've avoided most of the holidays in the world. You still wind up with things like in China, there's a week off for the Dragon Festival, I believe it is. So we need to be very clear on what holidays are where if we want to start to combine regions and countries. But 
Generally, it's safe if you can avoid Mondays and Fridays. Most of the world is working. And when we're designing content, we need to plan it out. Now, I am cognizant that most of you on this session with me are probably not learning and development professionals. If you are, I'd love to connect with you one-on-one -on -one and, and see if we can start our own little mini network within We Connect. But that just because you're not learning professionals doesn't mean you can't think about what the design of your learning program is going to be. And I say start with a blueprint. So this is a blueprint for a, a leadership topic. And in a blueprint, um, you have guiding questions. Now, if you are in learning and development, think about your performance objectives and then turn those around. Your guiding questions are what your learners would use in a search engine if they needed to learn this on their own. What would they search for? What would they Google? And that supports an approach called inquiry-based learning. Most of us learn this way. When we need to know something, the first thing we do is we go to our favorite search engine and we type in a question. Think about designing your training around the questions that people will be asking. And then you think about things you want them to do. If you're going global, you're probably not expecting people to be live and online for two days straight. So you're probably creating a blended learning solution. So what can they do? They can read an article. They can download an infographic. They can, we don't have these examples here, but they could, um, they could access a, a, an e-learning or, or watch a video. And this could be when you're brainstorming, these things could do could be accessing content that you know already exists in your organization that you've developed and you want to increase access to, or it could be your wish list. What, but I think what tools do you want them to be able to use after training is over? We want this model video of how to close a sale to always be available to them. So think about what tools they could use, and these are the things that they're going to do as part of your blend. And then you have to think about ways to connect and collaborate. This live time together is so precious in today's economy, especially in a global economy where people are virtual, they're mobile, they're in different regions and different countries and different time zones. So if you're gonna bring people together for training, make it worth their while. What can you do in the live online sessions, for example, that they couldn't do on their own? Usually it's talk, express opinions, work through problems, collaborate. So how are you going to connect people and collaborate? How are you going to take advantage of this very precious live time? And then a checkpoint is effectively, it's how are we going to evaluate that they have learned? They are going to deliver a sales presentation and their manager is going to evaluate that sales presentation. They are going to submit a project plan and we're going to give them feedback on a project plan. But start with a blueprint and you don't need to be a training professional to do this. But when we're creating our blueprint, we want to think about these five moments of learner need. This is what I want you to think about. There are so many more times that we all learn than when we're in a formal class. You may have heard statistics that say only 20% or 10% of learning happens in a formal setting. And as much as 70% happens on the job or informally. So there are five moments of learner need and we're good as a learning and development industry when people are learning for the first time. That's when you go to a class or you take an e-learning. But what happens, say, when things go wrong, moment of need number four, or when things change? People are probably not going to go back to a formal class when something goes wrong. They need answers now. And the, are they going to go back to your training materials? Are they going to go back to their search engine? If we design that formal training, 
when we put that blueprint together, we think about not just formal learning, when learning for the first time, we think about how do we address all of these moments of learning need and what do we build in? And we build those tools as part of our formal training. But this can get very complex. It might even sound very complex. What do I do first? Do I do an e-learning? Do I watch a video? Do I read an infographic? Is that even important? Or is all the important stuff really just going to happen when I get to the live class? Well, we advocate creating a map, a roadmap for learners to follow through their learning journey. And this just is a, you don't, the details don't matter here, but if we want them to not just give a list of all the things they need to do, but curate that content, read and respond, use, watch, reflect and share, attend a live online workshop. How long is this going to take? Why am I doing this? And I say, as soon as you create the blueprint, create a first draft of this map. It doesn't need to be this pretty. Of course, when I do it, I create it on paper and, and hope it makes sense on PowerPoint. I'm, I'm fortunate that I've got someone on staff that can create a, something visually pretty for me. But think about when you want to suggest something to your client or to your internal stakeholders about the program that you want to develop. If you just say, well, then there'll be an e-learning and then we want live online, that doesn't make a lot of sense. But if we can create a picture and say, this is our vision, then your stakeholders can see uh, why this investment makes sense. This is a great way to engage your stakeholders. And this is also a great starting point for what is going to be different from region to region. Do the words make sense? Do ev does every culture have uh, participate in the same way? And do uh, what needs to be translated? What needs and we're going to talk more about that. But this visual roadmap, even to start with, knowing it's going to evolve and change, starts to give you an interpretation, a vision of your journey. And you can use this to com start your the communication process. And the last step I want to talk about as far as design is concerned before we go into regionalization of content and an approach that will work there is you do need to implement an evaluation strategy. The global economy is very data driven right now and we can collect a lot of data on our training programs. We want to make sure we're collecting the right data. And this is a very learny slide that it might not be um, as relevant to all of you individually. So I want to say at a high level, training programs always need to tie back to business outcomes. Before you decide what it is you want to teach and how it is you want to deliver that instruction, you need to know what business problem you're trying to solve. That needs to be articulated very clearly. Maybe you're trying to reduce turnover in a, fa in a factory setting, or increase quality, or address errors, or get uh, new hires up to speed on the job and effective more quickly. What are the business goals? I always ask myself when I think about these business outcomes and goals, in order to do what? We want to get new hires to a close to a level of mastery more quickly in order to um, increase our sales quotas or we want to de we want to um, decrease our let's say accidents on a factory floor by seventy two percent. We might also want to comply with regulations, but we need to know why we are implementing this training. So what are the business outcomes? 
What are we trying to get to with those business outcomes? And how does training support that? It might not always support that. If we're designing content and developing content and rolling it out to thousands of people around the world or tens of thousands of people around the world, it's got to be supporting a business need. If that need isn't clear, then it won't be successful and you won't have a chance probably to build the next great learning program. So you need an evaluation plan. How will you know if your training is making a difference? Before you can know if your training is making a difference, you need to know if people are applying what they've learned on the job. Before you can know if people are applying what they've learned on the job, you need to know if they've actually learned anything. So we always, with an evaluation strategy, start with the end in mind. If you are interested in learning more about an evaluation strategy and how we implement that for virtual and blended learning, that's something I ask you to drop me a note about because we've got a lot of information beyond what we're providing here in this webinar. But now we get to regionalization. And regionalization is much more than translation. This is a academic article and the author says, this is a quote from an academic article, excuse me. Culture means different things to different people. It denotes civilization, but customs and traditions and codes. And we need to think about that when we're developing a global training plan. I'm going to get into these different five ways to regionalize in a moment, but I want to start by saying what the paradox is. We've got two competing forces when we're creating a truly global program. On one side of that force is we want to have something that's cost effective, that we can roll out quickly, that, that updating is easy. And the easiest way to do that is just to create one program and not regionalize it, not translate it, but assume that everyone that is participating will adapt to the culture of the host country. On the other hand of that equation is we do want to make sure our content is relevant to people, to learners in Turkey and Australia and the United States and Japan, all very, very different cultures. But that's expensive. It's expensive to regionalize. Again, that's more than translation. It means making sure it's culturally appropriate, that it adheres to the laws and codes of conduct in each region or country. So that's the opposite end. And, and if it doesn't appeal to learners as individuals, they might disengage from the whole program. This con it leaves you with a feeling like this content wasn't created for me. And that can be very disengaging. For all of us in our own businesses, it's the same problem, isn't it? This, this product wasn't built for me. It was built with somebody else in mind. That's why in marketing we create personas. And we do the same in training. What is the persona of the learner? So how do we meet those two goals of creating custom, engaging experiences for the individual countries and regions, but also minimize costs as much as possible? And of course, like everything, we need to meet in the middle. The, the way we do that, and this is something I'm working on articulating, so I'd look forward to your feedback on how I say this, is the live online instruction 
these virtual classes like we're in right now are multicultural. Maybe we're t we teach them all in the language of the business. In, in this case, maybe it's English. And we get people to collaborate and talk and learn how to work together. Because remember, as we're teaching people to learn on a global basis, we're also teaching them how to work on a global basis. But the self-directed content, the videos, the e-learning, the tools that you want them to use on the job in those other moments of learning need, those tools are regionalized and customized and translated for each individual culture. That gets us the best of both worlds. And let me walk through these five ways to regionalize and explain how it's going to work. Our first point, remember, translation is not regionalization. Just taking particip learner materials or an e-learning and translating it from English to German or English to French doesn't mean it's going to appeal to that other language because some things just don't translate well. We have to make it culturally appropriate. And there are experts in this world that really do a great job of specializing in regionalization. So look for a regionalization partner. It's something that we work very hard to ensure. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how much money you spend or how great you think your training is, your learners won't learn. We also need to contextualize content. This is what I mean by that. If I talked about our the possibility of combining a class on the east coast or the west coast of the United States with China because they can both learn at the same time, but not everything's going to be in context for them. Let's think about selling. A selling approach in China might be very different than a selling approach in the United States. So how do we put those approaches into context? Building on what I said earlier at the beginning of the slide is we make sure that their self-directed training materials, videos, e-learnings, tools, downloads, are appropriate for their culture and it's contextualized for their culture. But when we bring people together in the live online sessions for practice and collaboration, we, we start to move to step three, build on the diversity in the corporate culture. What a wonderful thing to teach the United States and China the differences in the way that they sell. How can we learn from each other? How can we collaborate? How can we help one another? How can we build understanding? So it, we need to do more than just say, yes, we understand that we sell differently in China than we do in the United States. We need to make that part of the training experience. If you're not going to build on that diversity, why roll out a, a global training program at all? Let people learn independently. We move, to, we move around the slide here to number four, a native language producer. A producer in the context of virtual and blended learning is an assistant instructor. Today I'm helped by Andrea, but um, in a, and this is a webinar approach, so she's acting as a host today. But in a full training approach, she would be telling me to stop talking. Here's some questions. We've only got three minutes left. Did you know what happened in the e-learning? This is what people posted in the discussion forums. And whenever possible, have su that support available in the native languages of everyone learning. Now, we can't have every language available live and online, but they can be available in the self-directed communities, answering questions in the discussion board. And how do we make sure all of this happens? We create in the development process a no region left behind task force. I just work on a global project for a, actually a company based in Germany. And 
regionalization was critical to them. And they had representatives from every region as part of the development process giving feedback and being advocates for the learners and the business in that region. Because remember, we're here to support business outcomes. So we need always need representation from the business as well as the learners in each one of those, in each one of the regions or countries that we're talking about. So we've created content, we have a blueprint, we have a plan, we know how we're going to evaluate whether or not our training has been successful. We've really thought about regionalizing, putting things into context, what information should be in a self-paced format, what information should be live and online, and how do we balance uh, expediency and cost with the need to engage learners in the, where they live and where they work. But the next step is to pilot that content. Pilot means to test it, to test it in a real world environment. And all of the content, not just the live stuff. Our tendency is to focus on the live, whether it be face-to-face -face or virtual classroom, and figure, out, figure that the self-paced stuff is just gonna work on its own. If you're going to roll out a blend and there's self-paced components to your blend, you need to test it every step of the way. Multiple regions should have their own pilot if possible. And I know that economically and from a time perspective, that's not always possible. But then you need to have representatives from each of the regions participate in the pilot. And a pilot means we're willing to change. We need to be ready to change on the go. Meaning change, be very agile, and not hold too closely to something we thought was perfect because it's not perfect because now we need to plan for a global implementation. And there's a lot of information on here. Uh, I'll make sure that you've got access to the slides if you, if you want to have these, these exact words. But we need to plan for success up front. We, we've already started to blueprint it. We need to think about what we're trying to develop, what the business outcomes are, but we also need to think about what resources we have. If you are a designer of training or you have somebody that designs training in your organization, just because they know how to do it for face-to-face -face doesn't mean they have the experience to design content on a global scale. And also, we need to think about multicultural facilitation. It's not that I am delivering content from the United States and all my students happen to be in France, it's that I'm delivering content from the United States and maybe they're in France and England and Saudi Arabia and maybe somebody decided to join from New Zealand or Australia. That's a different facilitation approach. It's nuanced, but how do we make sure we don't disengage these learners that are joining us from so many different places? If we're not experienced, we'll tend to teach to our own um, preferences as opposed to the global preferences. And teaching virtually is different. Teaching live and online is a different approach than teaching face-to-face. -face. So we need to upskill them there as well. And just like any good global project, we need an implementation plan that has budgets and how do we engage our subject matter experts? And how much time do we need to prepare our facilitators to teach this content? And we need to know how to address our stakeholders in the business, in the training community, and our learners where they're working and where they're learning. It makes a difference. Learning from your desk is different than learning from your phone or learning in a classroom. How do we engage people in all of those different learning environments? You create these connections between content and between people and stakeholders by taking advantage of the technology you already have in place, Slack, Microsoft Teams, possibly your learning management system. A communication plan is so important. We do want to take advantage of this community of learners that we're building. 
I don't want to get to get you together just once and then you go away and you never interact again. We have so much to learn from one another. And expanding that role of the producer, an assistant instructor who can support the learners where they are and where they live, a learner advocate. They don't have to be a content expert. They need to be able to answer questions about that technology and the deadlines and the communication plan. So what a lot of stuff I, I just talked about. Um, the winning formula is bringing the content you want to teach, identifying that and mapping it out really engaging the people, the stakeholders, that's the learners, the training community, and the business stakeholders, and doing it in such a way where we're encouraging global engagement. And maybe that's balancing your blend by making the self-directed content regionalized and contextualized, and bringing the live online sessions together in a way that creates a global, not just learning community, but working community. If this is the year that you're going global with training, think about what your own organization's formula is. And if you're somebody that supports external clients, what is their formula for success? We need to think about all of these things independently, but also in combination with the other elements. Everything's critical to success. If we focus just on technology and not on content and people, for example, your program probably won't be as successful as it could be. I've talked about a lot. There's a lot of information that you can download, and we'll paste this back into the chat again. Maybe make this available with the recording if that's possible. Here's a download where you can get links to recordings and blogs and videos and infographics and ebooks on how to go global with your training. And also, I wanted to let you know that I'm going to be at We Connect International Day on June 24th in Baltimore. And if anybody wants to talk about this in depth a little bit more, just drop me a note, whether you want to talk on the telephone or whether you want to talk face-to-face. -face. And now I'm going to stop and give you a chance to ask questions in the chat. Andrea, um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Jennifer, for all this information. I, I feel like everyone that's that's listening has, has learned something new and, and has some knowledge on, on where to get some resources that could be helpful to them as well. Um, let me pull up the uh, question box. There are a couple of questions. Um, Great. And while you're looking up the questions, I want to say how much I appreciate the fact that that you're attending webinars like this and we're talking about making training interactive and engaging and this is a this is a hard way to learn this listen only mode until the end and I also understand that your time is very valuable. So thank you for investing it in in this particular topic. Okay. So one of the the questions I received here says Language is always a challenge, and when I say language, I mean in tone. In my experience is that most training pl platforms I cater to educated people with at least high school degrees. However, when training women SMEs, the level of education varies, and the training that is available is not always effective. People disconnect when they use advanced or too technical language. Do you have any recommendations? Uh, actually. And the problem there sometimes, I'm going to rephrase that a bit, in that if sure. we've got uh, an educated or more experienced audience in a particular topic, you can teach a little bit more quickly. But when, we go, when we're going global, besides the language barriers and culture unknowns, we also might have a very mixed audience where they have different experience levels and different education levels. And that, that can be very challenging. So, Think about what everybody needs to know, not what they know already, and create tools for that. Those might be checklists and vid short video lectures, the three to five minutes long, uh, maybe e-learning tests or assessments. And that provides a common language. I have my 
audience is usually training and development professionals. And I've created a, a toolkit, a separate toolkit than this, on how to, on what language we're using in e-learning to give it a consistent language. Let people learn that stuff on their own, at their own pace, and give them checkpoints along the way. And when you get together live, start with some kind of activity or assessment or test to refresh everybody's memories, but not reteach it, you know, all the stuff that they were supposed to learn or we, we encourage them to learn on their own, and use that live time to apply what they've learned. But every time uh, something new comes up, and you have to explain something, remind them, say, by the way, there was a video to reinforce that. So if you forget again or you need some practice in the future, always go back to that video in a particular moment of learning need. So the best way to engage all of your audiences is to have tools that support all the different learning levels and use the live time to practice with those tools and collaborate. Okay, that's actually a, a perfect segue because one of the other questions was sometimes there are several tools used in mixed learning and I'm wondering if that ever gets complicated uh, for the learner. It does get complicated and I'm going to, uh, I'm going back, oops, what I'm going to do is go back to a slide here and uh, bring this up. It does get complicated for the learner, and I think that's a lot of reasons why mixed or blended learning has failed. That's why I'm a big advocate of this mapping the content so they know what order it's to use the to access the content in. They know what how much time there is to access that, that they that they need to invest. This helps um, helps map out the blend. And we can even make this uh, more detailed, or maybe on page two, we can explain what each of these tools are. Uh, you know, often in our training, we'll download tools that are, are just Microsoft Word worksheets that we have people complete during the training. And then they have those templates later on. So if we teach them how to use the tools as part of the training, then they can use them later on. But I agree with that. Um, with that participant that it can be very complex. So map it out and, and curate it, meaning how much time, why do I use it, when would I use this again later? Okay, thank you. Um, and another question that's come through is, how do I get the right learners in the room? Are applications the only way um, to filter? I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by applications, the only way to filter, but how do you get the right, right learners in the room? If it isn't being mandated by your organization, actually, let me back up. One of the great, way, I call this campaign learning, by the way, where we have a lot of different tools. So imagine that this isn't just innovative leadership training for managers, but it's just leadership training in general. And we have lots and lots and lots of topics and think about this map, but with lots and lots of different tools. And if you could see me, I'm just throwing my hands around, just so excited that you asked this question. Within that, we can have people map their own learning journeys. So if we take out the live online stuff, people can say, well, I need to know how to run a meeting. I need to know how to uh, coach for performance. And these are in different classes, what we would have called classes, but this content is all here. I can create my own learning journey, or we can create different learning journeys per role, but we use that same content over and over again. Do you think I'm answering the question, or did I go way off? I, I understand what you're saying. I don't see any follow-up comments from the same person, so I assume that um, you've answered the question. Um, and uh, I think uh, I'm going to ask a question that will sure. lead to kind of closing up um, the webinar since I'm weary of time. Um, how do you get people to answer the surveys at the end of these module topics or at the end of your training in general? Sur surveys are rough, right? Because you're at the end here. I send you a survey now and you've got a meeting in two minutes. So 
One is you want to keep your survey short, three to five questions, and only ask questions that you're actually going to change. Did you like the GoToWebinar format? You know what? If we connect can't change the GoToWebinar format, don't ask that question because we can't do anything about it. Only ask questions that you're actually going to address and make them very learner-centered. We actually are rolling out uh, eight hour class on just this very topic. How do you evaluate and how do you get people to participate in evaluation? Uh, you ask the questions in a way that show the learners um, that, we're, that we're asking how to improve the learner experience, not how to improve the business outcomes. We need them to get very what they call learner centric. And I'm trying to think if that person wants to drop me an email, I might have a tool I can email them to. Um, Get to get to that. Oh, that's you. <laughs> how, to, how, yes. how to get to that very specifically? So you know my email address. So um, okay. So we have a whole class coming up on this in in May. So it's 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 right in the top of my head. But there's a there's a special way to to write it to engage the learners so they know that we're trying to help them, not trying to help us. Okay, great. And and I just want to remind everyone that's listening as well that there is a follow up survey to this webinar, and we would have it if you answered it because as Jennifer mentioned um, these are things that we can address in future webinar sessions um, we have just a couple minutes left Jennifer and I want to give you the opportunity to wrap anything up or expound upon anything um, before we we end the the webinar yep sure so the last one final piece of advice is as you're going global I would suggest keep it simple don't try to create a 17 week blend to start because that is not just new for you but it's new for your learners and it's new for their managers and nobody knows how to handle that so we need to build um, a great course to start with is new hire training or onboarding wh whatever you call it because we're teaching people how we learn at this organization we, um, and eventually people will expect that this is the way we learn in this organization and also, I would say start with the technologies you have already. It's very nice to say, oh, look, virtual reality and gamification. And I mean, that might be a great application of those tools for your training. But remember, it, the learning curve isn't just for your learners. It's for your development team as well. So if possible, start with the tools you already have or be willing to uh, to hire people that know how to develop that. Otherwise, you don't want your first program to fail because you didn't know how to develop with the technology. Uh, of course, we'd love to help you and your clients with any of this. Even if you're not a training organization or don't have one, your clients have a training organization. So I'd be happy to answer any questions people have. And, um, and I hope to be able to connect with some of you in real life in June. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, Jennifer's contact information is on the screen. Um, be sure to, to write that down. Um, and uh, Jennifer, we'll see you in June. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye.